give a little peek at the subject of Dr. Fred Resnick, who's going to talk to us about cardiac catheterization and catheter embolectomy in the setting of pulmonary embolism. Uh, Fred, welcome to the conference. It's an absolute privilege to, to be here to, to talk to this group and uh, to also hear the incredible insight of, uh, of, of the speakers who have come before me. And I know Dr. Cohen is going to speak in a few, a few minutes uh, about surgical embolectomy. Um, I uh, do some uh, research that's supported, but uh, I don't have any conflicts for this, uh, uh, this discussion. So what I was going to uh, speak to was a case to consider. I know that there's uh, many patients in, in the group. I don't think uh, the patient of interest uh, is here, but if they are, uh, I will uh, gratefully acknowledge you if you'd like to be acknowledged. Um, oops, that's um, and think through uh, some of the options that we have for the treatment of what is termed massive uh, pulmonary embolism. And focus specifically on catheter-directed treatment, those therapies that we can use by going through the veins and blood vessels of the body to get to the targeted area where the occlusive thrombus is. Talk a little bit about the devices that are available, and especially focus on how well they work and their safety. And finally, think a little bit about what is called the IVC filter, inferior vena cava filters, because they have really been shown to make an enormous difference in outcome. So, uh, not to read all of this, but to remind me, I wanted to tell you about a gentleman who came to us uh, literally on Christmas Eve, because Sam's correct. They always present <laughs> when sick <laughs> on holidays. So, an uh, 83 year old gentleman who came in really um, complaining of uh, chest discomfort and shortness of breath. He had a small elevation in his troponin, uh, the test that uh, Sam and others have alluded to as a marker of very minor. Um, there's low level positivity of troponin, a marker of injury to the uh, heart muscle. And his history was notable because it carries some of the risk factors that Dr. Libby so uh, pointed out so eloquently earlier. The gentleman had a history of colon cancer, had a history of lymphatic cancer, and he had a history of DVTs in the past, as well as a recent portal vein thrombosis, probably from a different cause than uh, Virchow's triad, but uh, nonetheless, he was uh, certainly a candidate for problems uh, uh, with his homeostasis. His, his normal clotting and, and a lysis of uh, uh, pathways. So he was originally treated with the thought that he actually had a coronary syndrome because of, of his EKG changes in his troponin, but a catheterization of the heart showed that there was no change in his coronary anatomy. Uh, but, a, but a CT angiogram that was uh, described so eloquently by Dr. Rubicki brought us the diagnosis. And what that showed uh, was the following. I'll try to highlight this. Uh, um, so this is uh, the pulmonary angiogram showing actually the, the left pulmonary artery and this dark uh, filling defect here is a, a very large thrombus, or really including a segmental artery, or, or, uh, artery. and uh, here is the same slice looking now to the uh, right pulmonary artery with a complete occlusion at that point. And in fact, just depending on the plane of this imaging, it was a huge saddle embolus. But the patient really was just uh, looking pretty well and not... Um, his blood pressure was just starting to decline at the time that his, uh, uh, these pictures were taken, the CT, uh, uh, CT uh, angiogram were taken. Now, what we know uh, from work that Dr. Niels Cooper, who is a fellow here under both uh, Dr. Goldhaber and also in our cardiac catheterization lab, is uh, that the I -cop uh, copper study, uh, the registry, uh, all copper registry, showed a huge difference in the outcome of patients. This is out to uh, 90 days if you have a, a non-massive pulmonary embolism versus a massive pulmonary embolism. And this harkens back to what uh, Sam was just describing. We have to know when to break out the bigger guns for the patients, who, which patients really need the extra therapy um, more than standard anticoagulation. Now, even non-massive PE uh, has a pretty high mortality rate in this, in this registry, 14.7% at 90 days. But that uh, it's up four times higher for massive PE when associated with a, a low blood pressure on presentation. Now, why is this? I think the pathophysiology uh, has been described 
at the basic level of how the clocks form, and everyone, uh, I think, has been touching upon the mechanism that it's really this problem of the, of the right ventricle, the pumping chamber that's uh, pushing blood through the lungs to become oxygenated, to return to the heart, uh, the left ventricle to then go to the rest of the body. The normal heart in cross-section is here. This is the right ventricle with the trabeculations that, that Dr. Rubicki pointed out in the pumping chamber right here. And when we um, block the outflow of the, of the right ventricle, which is the pulmonary artery, when we block that, we suddenly get an increase in the pressures of the pulmonary artery, and that's an increase in the afterload of the right ventricle. The, the right ventricle is pumping against increased pressure. And the right ventricle dilates, and it can dilate relatively suddenly. Uh, with the features of the McConnell sign and echo, or what Dr. Rubicki was pointing out on CT screen, okay. so that's RV dilatation, RV increasing wall stress. Unfortunately, we get into a vicious cycle. The uh, wall stress itself causes the right ventricle to have to work harder, requiring more oxygen, which it's not getting because our cardiac output is, is falling. And we get into RV ischemia, right ventricular ischemia, weakness of the muscle, uh, impaired muscle function. So now the RV ejection fraction, the amount of blood per, uh, per contraction, starts to decline. It's becoming less and less efficient. <coughs> and we can see some of these uh, features um, <coughs> imaging as the septum that divides the left ventricle from the right ventricle appears to shift as pressure rises in the right ventricle and starts to compromise the, the uh, filling chamber of the left ventricle. And unfortunately, that leads to uh, a point that uh, I think Sam was making as well, which is now the left ventricle was fine all along, but it's not getting the, the filling pressures it needs to pump efficiently. And then we have left ventricular sort of failure, and now our blood pressure drops, and it creates even a worsening a vicious cycle of hypotension and shock. And patients can get very sick very quickly, and we saw what could happen acutely and out to 90 days. So uh, in terms of my uh, simplistic way of looking at pulmonary embolism, once we have the diagnosis, we have to think about the severity of the presentation. What I just described was the massive pulmonary embolism, and that really is accounted for 5% of patients presenting and diagnosed with pulmonary embolism in the large registries. And it really presents with shock or requiring CPR in the field. About 20% of patients fall into a middle category of high-risk pulmonary embolism. They're not in shock, but they have these other markers, either echo or, or other radiographic findings showing the stress of the right ventricle. <laughs> or this biomarker positive, the troponins, this, this very sensitive test of the stress on the, on the right ventricular muscle. But 75% of patients fall into a much more benign category, the low-risk pulmonary uh, embolism, where these, all these features, including the, the hemodynamic status of the patient, the blood pressure, the heart rate, are all uh, looking quite, quite fine. Now, for massive PE, the standard of care in the United States is thrombolytics. But for patients who can't get thrombolytics because they're at very high risk for bleeding, uh, surgical embolectomy or catheter embolectomy are options that uh, we're going to describe. And certainly for the very low risk patients, uh, being placed on urgent anticoagulation and then being carefully followed to prevent all these long term sequelae uh, th uh, that have been pointed out is essential. Uh, but that the patient does not require this level of aggressive therapy out of Sam's toolkit that he had been describing. We still are not quite sure what to do with the middle patients. I think that. Um, uh, history has told us in other conditions that these sorts of therapies are going to march backward because our, we know that these patients do so poorly. The positive troponin patients do almost as poorly as the massive PE patients. We just didn't know how to identify them before. In terms of lytics, I think Sam has pointed this out. There's been many studies performed. Lytics are not that beneficial when looked at across the entire population of pulmonary embolism. But when we look at the smaller subset of studies that have been done in patients with very large uh, pulmonary embolism, there is a significant benefit in terms of preventing death or recurrent pulmonary embolism, um, much lower in those patients who received a lytic therapy in these randomized trials compared to those patients who did not receive these therapies. Uh, but that comes at the trade-off of major bleeding and the, the, this increased risk of bleeding because of the very potent um, effects of thrombolytic therapies may not be warranted in the, in, the, in the smaller pulmonary em embolus uh, patients. We saw a, a brief introduction, which uh, Dr. Cohen is going to explore in more detail, of really a definitive th uh, treatment for patients who can't get uh, thrombolytic therapy, but who are presenting with one of these very high-risk situations. And this is uh, surgical embolectomy, where the pulmonary artery is actually incised uh, on the heart-lung machine, and the 
and its uh, embolus is removed mechanically directly out. An enormous uh, volume of thrombus can be removed and um, immediate relief to the obstruction of the right ventricle. Now, there are patients, though, who will not be good candidates for surgery. And uh, I think that in the same vein where many cardiac surgical uh, procedures have been refined over time, there are still populations of patients, the elderly, uh, the patients who are extremely high risk to have anesthesia, those with advanced lung disease, uh, patients who are quite debilitated from other conditions, may not do well with a, a major operation, even though in experienced centers, as you'll hear, the mortality rate can be very low. And in these patients, we think about catheter-directed from uh, thrombectomy and embolectomy, a, a less invasive way of getting as much of the clot out as possible, recognizing it will not be as complete as what we can do with surgery. So, um, really, in, when we start thinking about catheter embolectomy, we think that three criteria really should be present. The patients have to have a severe pulmonary embolism. It has to be big enough that it's compromising the right ventricular function. And it has to be mechanically large enough that our catheters will be able to do something meaningful to it. So if it's a large pulmonary embolism that showers completely the periphery, um, it's an unfortunate reality that our catheters will not be able to help. And I don't think pulmonary embolectomy in that situation would help either, but that's a really rare occurrence. And finally, at this point, really contraindication, whether it's uh, absolute or relative or the risk-benefit ratio really weighs against it, that thrombolysis should not be the preferred therapy. And again, I think that catheter-based uh, embolectomy is in particular value in patients that increase uh, operative risk. So when we do a catheter procedure, it's uh, really the goal is to extract or, or break up, fragment in any way to try to relieve this obstruction. And there's all sorts of tools in, in our sub-tool kit in the cath lab of how to, how to deal with these. We can also apply directed, focused, low-dose lytic therapy uh, into the clots themselves, reducing the total amount of lysis for those patients who may not have absolute contraindications, but relative contraindications. We can, at the same time, open up vessels that are, are blocked with uh, residual thrombus using balloon or stenting techniques, and we can leave catheters in place for low-dose uh, durable uh, lysis for 12 or 24 hours to help further resolve the clot if necessary. The goals of the therapy is to really try to relieve this obstruction that the right ventricle is facing, reducing the vascular resistance and pulmonary artery pressures, recovering the right ventricular uh, function. And when you do this, you get an immediate improvement in arterial pressure and an improvement in survival and symptoms as well. But what's important uh, for us to learn um, as image-guided therapists is that it's not always the making the picture look better, it's making the patient actually uh, improve hemodynamically. You can uh, make dramatic changes in uh, the ability of the right ventricle to function by making small changes in how much uh, clot actually uh, is present. The catheters that are currently available, the record setter that Sam showed from uh, Lanex Hospital uh, was this Greenfield suction catheter. It's been available for a long time. It's a very stiff catheter. It's associated with uh, some injuries to the blood vessels and, and uh, in the chest much more flexible catheters and that are much smaller is a rotational pigtail catheter that just breaks up the clot. And then these three catheters, which are designed to extract the clot, either, um, generally speaking, in tiny fragmented form. The one that we use um, almost exclusively at this hospital is the AngioJet catheter, which is made by uh, POSIS, now part of uh, MedRag Corporation. And I'll, I'll just speak to a couple of these. So this is a, a angiogram showing I hope you can see it. This is the density of contrast going into the left lung. And the whole pulmonary artery and all the branches should be dark, filled with contrast. And you can see all this light material here is where the, the contrast is just eking around this enormous thrombus that's sitting there, this enormous embolus. But after just maceration, I'm sorry, this is it. Um, after extraction using the closest catheter, um, we restore the blood flow down um, to this major channel to the uh, inferior segments of the uh, left lung. And if you uh, look at the resolution in this segmental artery of the clot, you can see here as sort of filling half the artery, uh, immediately after treatment, there's uh, complete uh, resolution of that burden of thrombus. It's a little bit dependent on how long the clot has been sitting in the leg. As uh, Sam and others have pointed out, 
these clots do not occur spontaneously in the lungs. They've been forming over time, usually in the legs or pelvis, traveling to the lungs, and when they're firm, uh, when they're, they've been uh, existing for weeks, it's very hard to dissolve them without a medication or mechanical therapy. The Aspirix uh, catheter is a new catheter that was uh, designed uh, and it has a um, uh, approval for use in specific circumstances in the United States. It was, I believe, designed by Niels Kuchler, the fellow that uh, Sam and I shared, who's a, a brilliant uh, gentleman now at uh, uh, University of Zurich in Switzerland and is really one of the world leaders in this field. It's a privilege to be able to share, um, share our experiences with him. But this is a very flexible catheter that can res uh, remove enormous, uh, enormously large clot burdens very quickly. And I'm sure as Dr. Cohen is going to show you, uh, for the surgical literature, there's actually a very high success rate for the catheter-based treatments on the order of 80 to 95 percent with very uh, promising survival um, statistics. But there are risks, uh, which is why we don't apply these therapies to every person who has a significant pulmonary embolism, only those that are really challenged by the hematic compromise of RV, right ventricular dysfunction. And they're listed here, and that's why it's so important to have this multidisciplinary team that Sam spoke to so that we can make the best choices uh, for the particular situations and particular um, considerations of the case that were presented there. In terms of um, outcomes, there's a large table from Dr. Scott and all uh, published last year looking at catheter therapy. Um, but if we can apply uh, some dose of um, local lytics, uh, the numbers are unfortunately so small, I, I don't think we can draw too many conclusions, but the outcomes seem to be very positive regardless of the mechanical way that one chooses to try to get the catheter out. Uh, not nearly successful if we can't use uh, adjunctive lytic therapy. Turning the page uh, just for uh, one minute before finishing up uh, with catheter therapy, thinking about um, ways of preventing the next pulmonary embolism. And uh, this is a big issue because if the first pulmonary embolism compromises the patient so significantly, uh, the next one could really tip the scales in a way that would maybe not be recoverable. So a uh, technology was devised about 25 years ago to mechanically interrupt the inferior vena cava um, above the pelvis but below the renal veins and prevent a recurrent DVT from traveling up to uh, the lungs and therefore prevent uh, a recurrent PE. But there are uh, long-term complications that can occur with filters. So the filter is placed right here where this dot is, or the circle. And so the idea is, uh, and this is what it looks like, I think Sam Scholl showed you, that it's a multi-pronged sort of umbrella type device that we place with a catheter and expands inside uh, to adopt the shape of the inferior vein cave and just filters any large clot from traveling north towards the heart. And it's very effective at doing so, but it can get clogged with the clot. So if we have a clot that now forms down the, in the leg, the whole notion is that when it travels, it's only going to get to there and not all the way up uh, to the heart and lungs, where, again, the complication is all related to the, um, to the failures of the right ventricle. What's also been noticed in registry, um, and this is from the uh, cohort uh, study, is that those patients who are treated with IVC filters have a significantly reduced, um, a significantly reduced risk of death at 90 days. Now, this is uh, an observational registry, so those patients who are getting filters uh, may have uh, had reasons why they could get them as opposed to the patients who couldn't. But there was a dramatic risk reduction, and this was seen again in the Prepage study, um, which showed that while it reduced with current PE, there was not a great difference in outcomes and heart outcomes in terms of mortality. So back to our patient. We, uh, we went ahead on Christmas Eve um, with the input of Dr. Goldhaber, the team, and uh, some of our colleagues, and um, went after these uh, large clots. This is, we can see it very clearly, the huge obstructing thrombus right here in the right pulmonary artery, and then here in the left pulmonary artery. Um, the saddle embolus appears to have, at this point, fractured and now is obstructing major blood flow to both sides. And using our techniques of, of using that angiojet, that suction catheter system that breaks up the clot and sucks it back in, as well as some balloon angioplasty to restore flow to areas where there was residual clot, uh, we were able to restore flow. It doesn't show it well here because it's not a subtracted image, but we have normal perfusion to both lungs now. And the patient did, did well. And actually, after 30 days, the patient came back. This is what he looked like on the day of the procedure with these huge clot burden in the tube. And this is yesterday. 
Um, <coughs> some of that is just due to the medicines that he's been on. Some of it is due to his endogenous lytic process. Hopefully, none of it is due to any fragmentation, but the patient doesn't demonstrate any problems uh, elsewhere in his lung system. So we think that uh, this is what we're shooting for. So in conclusion, um, we know that the mortality of massive pulmonary embolism is, uh, is significant, 50%, if we cannot use lytics or embolectomy. Uh, mortality after surgical or catheter embolectomy uh, can be as high as 20%. But catheter embolectomy is an effective alternative to surgical uh, treatment in patients with massive PE, hemodynamic compromise, and contraindications to lytics. And IBC filters are associated with a, a tremendously reduced risk of recurrent PE and death in registry data. So uh, thank you very much, and thank you for coming today.